You are tuned in to Sound Science with me, your host, Dr. Yuande Pierce. COVID-19 hasn't gone anywhere, so we're all still keeping safe here at Dub Lab by recording away from the studio. So I'm actually recording in my living room right now. So please forgive any background noises or quotes in the sound quality. This is very much DIY radio. If you follow the show on Instagram, you'll have seen a few exciting announcements over the past week. First of all, Sound Science got a tasty makeover with the help of my good friend and super talented multidisciplinary designer, Nick Shear. So if you haven't seen the new look, then you can go over to at Sound Science Podcast on Instagram. It is very sherbety and I love it. Secondly, I announced that Sound Science will be covering a broader number of topics. This show was born of a love of music and has mainly focused on the science stories that in some way relate to sound and music and I know that most of you share that same love. However, um, something that's been, I don't know, making me a bit restless is just how aware I am of all of the amazing science that is out there and so I've decided that sound science should start featuring the science around more of the things that we're into. So please feel free to let me know what you want to hear about by hitting me up on Instagram at Sound Science Podcast or via the website www.soundscience.com soundsciencepodcast.com. Finally, it is somewhat of a rarity for the powers that be to give up any space on the FM dial in the LA metro area. So I am beyond excited to tell you that Sound Science will soon be inhabiting the terrestrial waves via Lookout FM. Lookout FM is a collaborative project of the Westside Five, a corporation of five LA nonprofit institutions, including Dub Lab, Materials and Applications, Craft Contemporary, Machine Project, and Echo Park Film Center. So you can now tune in to 96.7 LP FM Burbank or 99.1 LP FM Hollywood to hear sound signs and so much more. There are so many amazing contributors and we're all really, really excited. So that's all of uh, my announcements. Um, welcome to episode 18, Forest Underground. We'll be back after this. When you look at the earliest depictions of nerve cells in the brain, it's hard not to notice their strong resemblance to trees. This is why the projections from nerve cells that allow them to communicate with each other were named dendrites, from the Greek word dendron, which means trees. This comparison isn't just limited to appearance, however. Deep beneath the ground, scientists have uncovered a new frontier of research which revealed that trees have something resembling a sort of nervous system in the form of an extensive root system which allows them to facilitate tree communication, learning and memory. This complex interconnecting tree network is dependent on maintaining a harmonious relationship with microbes in the soil, like fungi and bacteria. On the show this month, we're going to be getting to know fungi a bit better with the help of my guest Tosca Turan, an interdisciplinary artist working at the intersection of art and ecology. One thing that you may not know about fungi is that they can cover a large surface area by developing white fungal threads known as mycelium, which interact with tree roots through something called the mycorrhizal network. This network is responsible for kin recognition, which is where trees of the same species preferentially share nutrients, and tree resistance to environmental stresses like predators, toxins, and pathogens. In our interview, Tosca will be talking to me all about her skull sculpture and biosonification work with fungi and how she's figured out a way to gain a deeper understanding of their hidden world of mycelium. That interview, up next. I am so excited to introduce my guest on the show this month, Tosca Turan. Tosca is an interdisciplinary artist working at the intersection of art and ecology. Through developing bodies of work incorporating metal, glass, and electronics, Tosca received scholarships from the Corning Museum of Glass, Pilchuck Glass School, and the Penland School of Crafts. Her work has been featured at SOFA New York, Culture Canada, Metal Smith Magazine, the Toronto Design Exchange, the Memphis Metal Museum, Urban Glass Brooklyn, Music Works Magazine and Vector Festival. Tosca, welcome to Sound Science. It's so great to have you on the show. How are you? Thank you, Yuande, uh, for having me. It's great to be here. And I have uh, some allergies happening today, so I have a little cough just to let you know, you know. Um, but I'm great. I'm doing pretty good, all things considered, um, and just 
been able to, over this course of time of self-isolation and COVID restrictions, really actually focus a lot more on my sound work and things like that with mycelium and without mycelium. So just for the audience, where are you right now? I'm in Toronto, Canada. Ah, nice. And how is the weather there? Because in LA, I am melting daily. (laughs) Um, How are you coping with the temperature? Uh, Admittedly, it's pretty freezing cold in our house because we have AC. And even though we don't really crank that, we just, we have three floors. So it tends to get really cool on the lower floor, which is where I'm at. But outside... It's very humid, (laughs) but today it's windy and it's starting to cool a bit. It's been raining, which is really nice. Oh, that's nice. A bit of relief. I can't wait till the temperatures drop a bit, although I shouldn't complain. I love the fall, though. The fall, to me, is just one of the best times. Yeah, me too. It's like a renewal. It feels always quite, I don't know, reflective. And then, I don't know, it's cozy. It's cozy times in the fall. I really like it. (laughs) So Tosca and I met at New Nature, an immersive media and climate science exchange conference of sorts between scientists, artists, and technologists from Canada, Germany, Mexico, and the US, which was really, really awesome. And one of the highlights for me was your amazing biosonification piece at the listening party. So I was hoping we could start with your artist origin story up to this amazing piece. It was a really great exchange. I just thought it was fantastic meeting everyone and really interesting too because it was absolutely my first experience with Zoom and just interacting with people that way. So yeah, that was good. Uh, So I'm not originally from Canada. I uh, was born in San Francisco, California, and I grew up in Larkspur, California. At least my early years uh, started there and our house probably from birth until I was around five or six years old, was off a street called Magnolia Boulevard, which snakes through an old growth redwood forest. Part of that forest is our backyard. Yeah, my mom would tell me never to touch, eat, or pick any of the mushrooms (laughs) that were growing there because they were deadly poison, which absolutely made the mushrooms even more of a curiosity to me. So around the same time, my father was bringing home electricity electronic music quite a bit. It was the early 70s. So it was a lot of like Klaus Schultz and Tamita and Tangerine Dream, Wendy Carlos. And I loved this music so much. I just really used to think I wanted to create sounds like that at some point in time, but it just felt so far away. I'll jump ahead like several decades. (laughs) So yeah, so I've been a metalsmith for over 30 years and a glass artist for approximately 15 years. And the forms I would make, they would be kind of biomechanical. I have to say by accident because I was never really fully aware that I was at certain points in my career kind of replicating organisms in metal. But people would comment and say, oh, this reminds me me of a brain or this reminds me of a spine or I'd be like oh really and then I'd look at it differently uh so in 2009 I was invited to exhibit at SOFA uh, New York with Urban Glass Brooklyn and for that exhibit I created an unnatural history uh, which was like my own representation of pathogenic fungi and this installation included a soundscape which imagined the sounds of the world where these objects may have originated from. And that really started more of my journey into consciously knowing that I was making things that looked like mushrooms or fungus. At the SOFA show, scientists, I mean, I wouldn't know, but they'd say, hey, I'm a scientist here or there. And these are interesting taxa, or because I put like Latin names to them, but I was making up entirely you know, fictitious um, taxa. So that was a lot of fun. I'd have to say the majority of my metal and glass work drew upon my fascination with artistic representation of natural history and the creation of fictitious places in literature. Really things started shifting in my work. A lot of the metal and glass would often incorporate like electronics or sound elements or even like video if I could find little screens that might fit up inside of it. When the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster happened in 2011, I like it really impacted me and a lot of other people and the world itself. I really felt that's it, you know, we're uh, we've absolutely destroyed the environment and I 
really started looking at the materials I was working with and uh, was trying to find a material that wasn't so hard and toxic for the environment. It was like around that time, somebody had given me like a gourmet mushroom kit, like to grow your own mushrooms at home. Uh, it was like a birthday present or something. And watching them grow, I just, it was like that person knew, right? Um, right. <laughs> they had some idea. I started wondering about the substrate because of how the mycelium was growing through the substrate. It was just super interesting. It, there was something woody about it. I didn't know anything at all about anything really mycelium, mushroom related other than, you know, seeing them grow in the forest and eating them. But it's just how it felt and everything. So I started Googling and trying to see like if there was any information out there about that. I should probably, I'm going to cut here. <laughs> and so yeah, I was really looking at it like wood or how I could form it. And at around the same time, I came upon a Covative and their GIY materials. I immediately bought some of their GIY bags. So if you're not familiar, a Covative was selling, it's almost like it's a dehydrated, it's just a substrate. Back then it was, they had flax, hemp, something called Kenaf, and uh -huh. Aspen. And so you could purchase this bag and in it there were spores. And then you would add flour and water you know, to certain ratios, close the bag, let it sit in the dark, and over a couple of days, the mycelium would come back to life and fully myceliate the substrate. And then the concept is you break this apart and put it into molds or sculpt it. I experimented with all kinds of different flowers, um, whatever I had in my cupboard. And around the same time, I was really focusing a lot on new media workshops. And um, so I was studying a lot of coding and I took a workshop with the amazing Dr. Sarah Shuka. And she was teaching a workshop on uh, Physarum polycephalum, uh, AKA slime mold. <laughs> and working with that, it was just super fascinating. And to me, it was, you know, sparking more of this curiosity of working with this non-human organism. And Sarah proposed viewing the Physarum as an alien species from another planet and to consider like my work collaborating with alien life or non-human life. And this concept, for whatever reason, totally exploded in my mind. It was a total <laughs> oh my God moment. Wow. Yeah, um, the penny dropped. Yeah. And I was like, wow, can I communicate with these aliens? Yeah, okay. So more Google searches commenced. I was really thinking um, there has to be a device or a microphone that would enable me to hear, like, are they making sounds? They must be making sounds more than just movement. So I just really started researching more into certainly someone out there must have tried listening to things because up to that point, I really wasn't familiar with like the secret life of plants, for instance. Right. I, mean, I knew the album, but I didn't know like there's a documentary and where that really was originating from. So yeah, I started researching more and that's when I found some research from uh, Jagadish Chandra Bose and his ideas of plant perception and biocommunication, like the paranormal idea of plants being sentient. And then of course the secret life of plants and some research around that. But I found a picture in one of these searches of, it was a person sitting with headphones on and they were sitting in front of a clear acrylic box that was like full of moss and it had a mushroom in the center and I thought they were listening to the mushroom. So my searches started becoming a bit more focused and I found uh, something called, it's a nano microphone it's called the nano ear I believe. And so the nano ear could pick up sounds down to something around minus 60 decibels. One millionth like a level one millionth of that detectable by our human ears. So they were listening to microbes. So anyways, more searches and I came upon a MIDI module that was open source. And so I started take, working with that open source, uh, which is Arduino based and making my own modules from that. 
And so there are my biosonification modules. But that's the thing that even though they're listening to these frequencies out of our spectrum, those still have to be brought into our hearing spectrum. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So the first exploration with the biosonification is where Midnight Mushroom Music came from. I was in the kitchen uh, with my partner and actually we had our iPad there and I had plugged in a biosonification module, which can hook up to different things. And it's translating these sounds, if you will, into MIDI. So then Hmm. we hear them. So it's turning them into like notes or controls. So that's kind of, that's also, I should just say, very cool because then you could have a plant or have a fungi or a tree or yourself controlling imagery or something that, you know, you could attach to these different notes or controls, for instance. I think one of the reasons why I enjoy your piece at the listening party so much is because being able to communicate with non-humans and being able to turn this language that the human ear can't ordinarily hear is something that we can engage with. So your origin story is fascinating because it really sounds like very intuitively from a young age you were fascinated by the outdoors and all of the organisms that inhabit it and then develop this completely different craft to do with metal and glass but then resembled some of those early interests and then developed this way of actually being able to be in communication with these plants through technology. I really admire people who have so many prongs in their forks. (laughs) So it's really cool to hear how you got to making bisonification pieces. In looking through your work, which blows my mind, by the way, uh, it's pretty clear that you are a big fan of mycelium. Could you explain what mycelium is exactly? Because I had no idea um, before we met um, and why it's been at the centre of so many projects of yours, including your latest project, tentatively called Fryce Underground, which is also the title of this episode. Sure. Okay. so mycelium is like the root structure, if you will, of what we see in the forest is mushroom. So it's the vegetative part of a fungus or it's like a fungus-like bacterial colony. It consists of a mass of branching hyphae or hypha. And uh, the hypha are sometimes called shiro. Don't know the origin of that, but they're particularly called this within the fairy ring fungi. And um, mycelium is found in and on soil and like different substrates. So it's a branching network of thread-like hypha that will integrate integrate themselves with roots of trees, plants, and it's sending nutrients back and forth and it can help plants survive like all kinds of turmoil and things that are happening. And I've recently been reading more about it and finding out that trees particularly in cities when they're planted on sidewalks and cements coming right up to the base of that tree, but the tree is there all by itself. And the chances of that tree having mycelium underneath it are pretty slim. Oh, that's really sad. Yeah, so it would be cut off. You know, the communication networks don't always happen. But yeah, so mycelium is under earth, like the dirt, and it's generally one cell wall thick, but even though it's not very thick, it can like go on for miles and miles like uh, the humongous fungus is what I think about there's probably three but I've only really read about two one is in Oregon and it's apparently like 2400 acres in size wow Um, because of logging trails they cut through it but it would have been before they even knew this even existed it's somewhere between 2,000 to 8,000 years old is the estimate and it has pretty much destroyed the forest many times over but in doing that it's just created these deeper soil layers and these stands of trees so there's another humongous fungus that's in Michigan and this one is just around the same like 2,500 years old or older and it weighs they think around 400,000 kilos so that would yeah that's that's a lot and it's about 0.75 square kilometers these are huge they consist of armillaria 
Gallica, uh, which is a honey mushroom. And I know that it tends to grow in a spiral too. Like the mycelium grows in a spiral. The fruiting bodies, which are the mushrooms that we see. So that's how we know that there's, you know, there's mycelium happening underneath us or in the forests or, you know, even when we see mushrooms coming up through sidewalks, like they can be very strong. But so the fruiting bodies are the mushrooms that we see and that's how they get their spores out there. What an interesting organism. I can understand why <laughs> they've inspired so much of your work. Forest Underground is a work in progress at the moment. So you're, you're, you've just started working on it? Yeah. So the whole forest idea, so that's with the museum and they're called the a museum. <laughs> I was like, which one? <laughs> uh, so my idea with that is about the wood wide web and how like I think of Susan Seamard's work as she's a scientist in British Columbia that was able to prove these communications were happening between trees and that there's certain hub trees or mother trees. So what I'm trying to do is create like a small forest area and incorporating mycorrhizal fungi and looking at how that communication is happening and something that I'm very fortunate to have access to is some scientists in their labs at the University of Toronto. Just being able to have access to a lab, I think artists and scientists working together is just really fantastic. I feel like that relationship is a really interesting one. Um, there's so much overlap and they can both better each other's practice. And so it's cool to be able to have access to a lab and have scientists mm. who are invested in your work. Yeah, like so 90% of plants depend on mycorrhizal fungi. The mycorrhizal fungi enable like a shared communication network. And how I'm working with these scientists is like a glowing fluorescent protein is often used or GFP. Mm, yeah, I use that. <laughs> Yeah, okay. So, well, that's used, right, to be able to kind of map things or see, I guess, right, how proteins might be moving exactly uh, through an organism. And so I thought, well, I've played with CRISPR before with like E. coli or making glowing beer, but I was thinking of doing this with plants. I know a bunch of people that work with plants, so I reached out to them. And just to get these transgenic plants that will be in this, so it's going to be in an enclosed kind of giant terrarium. So trying to create like a, a boreal little forest environment to see if like people in the space and how, like, will we be able to see this kind of biosonification, like these signals happening? I mean, there's been some tests with proteins in these plants to look at how um, like insects affect them and how the plant is sending the warning signal. You know, we don't know yet if this is going to work or not, but that's part of the fun. Oh, that's so that's really interesting. Concept. That's one concept with this piece, but it's really to show like a soundscape happening in a forest through biosonification. What I found a lot with my work with mycelium biosonification is how emotional people get and the empathy that happens. And last year I was in Australia and I had been listening to the warata, I believe it's pronounced, these incredible flowers. Like they're huge, like mm -hmm. they're bigger than your head. They just, they're beautiful. They look kind of like an artichoke, but giant, like they're beautiful. At the residency I was at, there were fields of them outside of the studio. So I had hooked up some electrodes to it and I have different types of electrodes I've made where they're not just ending in like, you know, a biomedical pad. They might be fine silver wire or fine gold wire. So I can either put it within the soil into the roots mm -hmm. to pick up the fluctuations in conductivity. Anyways, the director had heard these sounds coming from the different gum trees and the warata. You know, she kept wanting to give us these bouquets of these incredible flowers and we were fine with them just being outside. But after hearing it, she's standing there by the flower with these shears and I saw her just drop the shears and lower her head wow. and then just stare at the flower and she picks everything up, came back in and and came to me and said, I just can't do it. I can't. Oh my goodness. Now that I've heard them, I can't. And I was like, oh no. <laughs> or maybe that's good. Just from some of the other installations, I mean, I've had people come up to me just really like just sobbing, crying because they just never thought of a mushroom or, well, in this case, it's mycelium, but you know, people will say mushroom as having any life force. It's possibly a really good educational tool or empathy building. I feel it's very important that everyone get more in touch with the shared environment mm -hmm. and that 
humans aren't at the top of that pyramid like it's not a pyramid exactly and i think for the most part it's i mean by nature we're inherently quite self-centered and we stomp around the world thinking that we run the place and i feel like for a lot of people it's just not having that realization so creating some way to empathize with them i think changes our perception of them and just makes us more aware i think it's more about awareness so when you've heard your plant you're not going to think of it in the same way as you did before But yeah, just it changes your awareness for sure when you hear sounds coming from something you would think like, wait a minute. (laughs) Yeah, <laughs> exactly and sound is so powerful I think because of language and how we communicate it's like very predominant in our communication so biosonification is something that I think is a really important tool um, but I really like how your work seems to be developing in such a way that it becomes more and more multi-layered so you have the biosonification but now you actually have the visual in another way I was thinking about the work that unfortunately was postponed because of COVID but will be showing next year at NASA, which stands for New Adventures in Sound Art. So you'll be exhibiting a grow dome installation called the NASA Transformation, the Mycorrhizal Rhythm Machine. Does that overlap with the forest underground? The Mycorrhizal Rhythm Machine would have happened in June this year. And the forest sound installation was going to happen this fall. So that has been moved to January. And NYSA has just moved it to next summer, probably June. And mainly these things are moved due to COVID because we can't touch things. And there's a touch element in both. Uh, so for the mycorrhizal rhythm machine, I thought I'd use the Grow Dome because it's a circular laser cut snap together uh, shelving unit that you can walk into. So I've, I've seen it. Yeah, it looks really cool. Cool. So you can put plants on them. So the idea is to have all these different plants and... And what I was thinking is, again, because of the mycorrhizal aspect, there will be different containers of plants that really have this symbiotic relationship with the mycorrhizal fungi. And just trying to look at the different connectivity and the growth over about a three month, maybe four month installation. So how these plants and the sounds change Mm. over that course of time. Oh, I love that. I create these like touch surfaces that will filter like the human biosonification, kind of merge it with some of the mycorrhizal and plant biosonification. Hmm. So there will be that collaboration. It's a lot of fun for people. So I understand NYSA and the museum wanting to keep that. Yeah, Aspect. absolutely. Let's just move it. It's such a great concept. I feel like these organisms being sensors and being able to provide so much information to scientists about um, what's happening in the environment, but also this idea of creating access to these organisms and being able to create empathy with them and hopefully making it a little harder maybe for people to ignore the impact that we're having on non-humans, uh, I think is really cool in your work. All living organisms use numerous signal transduction systems to sense and respond to their environment and thereby survive and proliferate in a range of biological niches. Fungi are no different. They possess almost all the senses used by humans. They can sense light, gases, chemicals and surfaces. They can even sense gravity, electric fields and adjacent objects. By studying the signaling processes involved along with genome sequencing, which provides a wealth of genetic and molecular information, scientists are gaining a greater understanding of how fungal signaling circuits operate at the molecular level to sense and respond to environmental cues. With that in mind, I wanted to share a specific clip from my interview with Tosca. Here she is chatting to me about an exhibition featuring her work. This snippet really gave me chills. I started sculpting. Um, that did work out too, <laughs> using the mycelium as an alternative material and sculpting with it and creating forms, which is really interesting, I feel, because I would like to keep my sculptures alive to just mm. kind of see what happens. For one, uh, a show in 2018 called Chaos Fungorum, like I started out growing a lot of uh, different shapes. So they were branching and growing, but they were growing into the paint. And the concept with this whole 
sculptural, like mycelium sculptures and everything was for Nui Blanche, we hooked those sculptures up to six different synthesizers and would be playing along with the mycelium. And so that was really, that was fun. And of course, a lot of very curious people came wondering what in the world. I found that the mycelium reacts, and I'm not exactly sure what it is reacting to, because even if I have it covered and it's protected, and then it's in, say, a black bag, Mm -hmm. and I know it doesn't have eyes, (laughs) it will react and respond to people I'm thinking it's the people coming up to it, um, not even touching it. Like I've had things happen where uh, it's been very musical, you know, and this is all like biosonification related. So Mm -hmm. I'm doing these sculptures. There's like always a sound component. And um, um, so at MOCA, which is the Museum of Contemporary Art here in Toronto, um, I had uh, studio there briefly for an artist residency that was with Mocha in collaboration or partnership with the Ontario Science Centre. Mm-hmm. And so I had a bunch of sculptures there and it was an open studio. So, it, you know, lots of visitors to the museum could come and go, which was fantastic for this sort of experimentation. So I have a whole bunch of, I had a greenhouse in this studio and everything. Um, And I had all these sculptures under domes and there's this, like this soundscape going that's coming from the mycelium and people are coming in, enjoying it and stuff. And I noticed as well as the other people. So this is what was really good about it is it wasn't just me seeing this happen or hearing it, but when children would come in, of course the kids are really like, they're having fun. They're in the Uh museum around And they would run right up to the table where the mycelium was under this dome. And for this, which is fun for you, I had sculpted it to look like a human brain. (laughs) Ah, nice. (laughs) I had the mycelium under this dome. There's this brain with these electrodes coming off of it, going into this electronic device. Whenever kids would approach it, it would become very chaotic and erratic. Like the sound just entirely changed from maybe being more pattern based and, Mm -hmm. you know, kind of nice, chill to super chaos. Um, And then they'd go away and it would go back to where it was. Um, But somebody came and I mean, I don't know who this person was. I don't know what was going on with them, but The moment they stepped through the threshold of the door, it was like everybody looked because the music stopped. And I was looking at them, but I mean, I say this person, there are a lot of people, but this, the energy, it was really negative or it just felt very like there was something going on. Like they seemed angry. I don't know who they were angry at or what they were angry at. They came in. And they were huffing and puffing, but there was no sound. And people were just really, honestly, their jaws were like, "Uh what is going on? And this person walked over to where I had the greenhouse. And I had just finished closing up the greenhouse and stuff Mm -hmm. and talking to people. So they they were starting to tug on the greenhouse. And I asked them, you know, oh, you know, if you want to see anything in there. And they interrupted and said, what, is there the monsters in here? like well um, well no <laughs> there's no ice cream in there oh, anyway, so <laughs> they, they finally they left like they left and they came in, in a huff they left in a huff but the moment they left the music started back. Back. Oh, and everybody God. was like what like, so strange. That, it was so strange but it was also so cool <laughs> because i was like there you go <laughs> It's been said that the mycelium revolution is upon us as they can produce everything from plastics to plant-based meats to scaffolding for growing organs and much more. How do you see this shifting your practice in the future, Tosca? Well, it seems to be heading more into being more in the forest, maybe ecology-based bioremediation. You know, like oyster mushrooms are great bioremediators and uh, I know Paul Sammons has worked with them as far as uh, with agricultural waste and creating kind of sandbags, but using the mushroom, like the mycelium in its place as a filter. 
and it could filter out toxins. And so I was thinking about how biosonification might be able to be used because the sounds change. Like a healthy mycelium sounds a lot different using the exact same parameters than when it's been contaminated. I've had mycelium accidentally be introduced to slime mold and the differences were extreme. I, I love creating things that I cannot not be creating, it seems. Like I just, I love hand work, you know, mm -hmm. and I've been wanting to work more with like the whole urban gardening movement. You know, there's community gardens that are happening uh, throughout Toronto, but a lot of the soil here is very contaminated just because of the old warehouses and and I think of oyster mushrooms, so like Chlorotus austriatus could be used in this area to bioremediate, like to help clean out those toxins. Mm -hmm. And that in itself too helps, you know, people learn more about how mycelium can work, how it can work with us or for us, because it's getting something out of this as well. Um, we can't eat those mushrooms, but they're just going to kind of cycle back into the soil and be like a fertilizer and then you know it's just making that soil better so i've been thinking more like i'm kind of heading into wanting to just really help and i'll say like give back mm. like a lot of the experiences i've had and just work with people i've been looking at more of just working with like the community here mm -hmm. and, like the community gardens and getting people to be able to also grow their own food and they grow so fast right now like over the past three days i have a whole bunch of mycelium going in my greenhouse and also in my kitchen and just over three days they're almost fully formed incredibly beautiful pink oyster mushrooms oh pink lovely yeah. <laughs> love a bit yeah, they're gorgeous <laughs> they're like they're quite beautiful you don't you don't really see them like really at all unless you go to a farmer's market they're not something mm. I think, in like regular grocery stores yet or even something like whole foods or, <laughs> or something yeah. I, I have never been there but they're beautiful and they grow so fast and you can yield so much out of you know just one block of mycelium I have absolutely loved chatting with you on the show today and there is so much that you're up to. Uh, if the listeners want to read more about you or follow you, is there somewhere that they should go? Do you have an Instagram or a website that um, you'd um, like to shout out? I will shout out Moth Antler. Mm -hmm. um, that is my Instagram. And they can also check out nanotopia.net. Mm -hmm. I haven't been keeping up with my blog so much, <laughs> admittedly, but I, I post there and my SoundCloud. I used to post every Saturday or Wednesday, there would be like a new Midnight Mushroom music kind of little session. Oh, cool. Um, but, yeah, but during COVID, I've taken that more into a live stream mm -hmm. off YouTube. And so it, it's monthly now, but yeah, I'd say my Instagram is pretty active. The Moth Antler. I'm posting like images on like my different mycelium work or the mycelium or biosonification workshops and just stuff going on. That's so great. Thank you so much for being a guest on the show. We got a chance to chat a little bit after New Nature, but yeah, this is the, the only time we've spoken since you've answered all of my questions <laughs> I've got to be really into yeah. mushrooms so I hope the listeners <laughs> feel the so same way <laughs> yeah. okay yeah you need to I think you should try growing some it's just so fascinating I'm going to I think my fear is poisoning myself but um, oh, no. I'm sure that I mean I have you now <laughs> you can, yeah. I can ask you <laughs> actually I have a couple workshops coming up and some are pay what you can for oh, people awesome they're on zoom so oh nice I think I will share that actually um, if you let me know when that is I would like to okay. attend um, I think everyone's going to be getting Christmas is coming up, so I think everyone's going to be oh, getting like little mushrooms awesome. that I've grown. <laughs> That's perfect. Awesome. Okay, Tusker, thank you so much Thanks again. So much. Um, and yeah, speak to you next time. Okay. Okay. Thanks so much. 
And that's it, folks. Thank you very much for tuning in. For show notes, you can go to www.soundsciencepodcast.com. The show will be archived via the Double Lab website in a few days and available as a podcast on iTunes in about a week. I would like to just quickly shout out my nephew who is 14 today. Happy birthday, Lanray Miles. Until next month, take care of yourself, everyone. You're doing great.